The internet has this funding myth that it's a very central, decentralized thing. But if you look at the actual usage today, much goes through a few centralized commercial entities like Google or Amazon or Facebook. And there are many single points for authorities or other interested parties to throttle or censor access to content. A speaker Will, will Scott, who is a recovering academic who has worked on distributed systems and security, among other things, thinks that the Internet should not have these uh, central points of control and wants to tell us about the building blocks of decentralization that will allow us to build a, another Internet that is less centralized and more resilient to central attacks. Have fun with the talk. Great, thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm really I'm really happy to be talking today, uh, and it's been great to see so many people uh, at RC3, even if just through uh, my screen. Um, in in reflecting on this talk, I think there's a couple messages, uh, and and the primary one for me has actually been really hopeful. That um, when when I think about what we uh, have with decentralization and what's getting built, um, the trajectory actually looks uh, promising in a lot of ways. Um, and, and I think the second message is that when we think about uh, the technical building blocks um, for decentralized systems, we really uh, are at the very beginning, um, that, that there's a lot left to do, um, and, and there's a lot of uh, work ahead of us. Um, so I want to start with with a story, um, and that story is a story of you know community and of of building new systems, um, and and the first step and the first question is how do you how do you build that community how do you find that community and I think the the answer that we have is things like this event, um, and and this is one that that maybe we don't have uh, all the systems of discovery and there's there's a whole talk here that that maybe we don't have. Uh, Time for which is how do you how do you find the people who share similar interests, um, and and the place where where we can start to think about decentralized technologies uh, is instead that you've got this community and you want to sustain it, and we actually have a bunch of decentralized tools and a really rich ecosystem to do that. Uh, so we can you know find our community and we can talk with with federated systems like Mastodon. We can have video chats with Jitsi. We can host our own files store our own data. We can collaborate on software projects by, by running GitLab. And so when you think about decentralized systems to uh, help a community be self-sustaining and independent, um, the, we, we have a set of fundamentals that do this well. And what we're, what we're doing is not developing new things, but it's, it's reducing the barrier of entry. Um, and so when you think about the sorts of things that are uh, happening today is you're, you're finding things like instead of having to find someone to run a server and, and run a complex thing like GitLab, um, you, you, you have new, new systems like Radical that, that can make that easy. So people just run a piece of software and they don't need to worry about the complexity of deployment. So we're, we're, we're reducing the barrier of entry, but we already have a set of building blocks that allow a community to do this. Um, great. So you've got your community. Uh, you've around an idea, around uh, an ideology, and you can build software and you can um, start to, to make this idea grow. Um, and so when, when you think about that, the next step is how do you, how do you make services, how do you make uh, ways for that idea to get to more people? Uh, and, and, and once that stops being a thing that you can just self-host that, that you would run on your own servers, we have building blocks now. We have we have underlying systems and design patterns for how do you take your service and and allow it to scale um, while maintaining independence. And and these are somewhat less developed. I think um, we'll we'll go through this in a little bit. But the the user bases are maybe uh, one or two orders of magnitude smaller than the previous ones. 
Um, but you can have files go on a decentralized um, CDN like IPFS or uh, a number of others. You can use um, uh, distributed database uh, abstractions, be they GUN or EarthStar or Hyperswarm or others that, that will allow messages to get passed in a decentralized way uh, and allow for some amount of synchronization and collaboration so that a service um, can go out to you know up millions of users um, without without needing to fall back to centralized technologies like Google or, or Microsoft or Facebook or etc um, and and so you can you can I think not only have have things that support your community but can then reach other communities and so so you know we're, we're sort of following the trajectory this is less developed and then we can go to the next step that's even less developed and this is now not only touching a virtual service, but but starting to interact with the real world. Because when we think about the successful technologies that um, that that are the Googles or the Facebooks of the world, they're they're not purely digital. They 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 go into our real lives, and this is this is a part that's still very much in development. Which is, um, you know, cryptocurrencies, uh, you know. Are a whole thing, but the thing that's maybe interesting is they help us bridge into the real world financial system, and so so our services still maintains independence while being able to touch that aspect. And likewise, um, the the promise of the DAO uh, or or of decentralized autonomous organizations is that you can maintain decentralization um, while interacting with with uh, real legislative, political, etc. systems. Uh, and so the thought is rather than having some core owner. Uh, who has to have power, you can encode beforehand uh, a contract of, of how this organization will work based on the principles and, and have that power remain decentralized um, in, in that there's not a single person that, that the, the existing uh, real world um, regulation systems you know, see as the source of all of this accumulated power and, and go after uh, and are able to then influence or manipulate uh, apart from uh, what the community wants. Um, and so this takes um, the form of these evolving and, and developing uh, systems like oracles, how you uh, you know have something that, that exists in a decentralized way uh, and then have it be able to interact with with existing real world systems. Um, and and you know the, the answer ends up involving um, both advances in, in cryptography and and in sort of thinking about how you um, find hooks that, that you can make these points of interaction. So what I want to go through in the rest of this talk um, is, is start with a, a grounding on a set of things that I would consider decentralized systems um, to, to give us a sense of scale and, and help ground us. Uh, and then I'm going to abstract one layer uh, to talk about the underlying models and technological systems that, that are common to a lot of them. And then talk about sort of two ways to think about the limits there. One is, you know, as these things grow, what are the emerging pain points that we see that, that we that we know of that are uh, in terms of sort of the existing um, technologies will you know are, are running into pain points, um, and then and then the other one is the the more uh, model properties. So these already are are failing us in some ways, um, and, and so how do we how do we think about whether there are alternatives that that uh, do not have those same properties are these things that we can uh, bolt on or do better with in the current systems and how do we do that so uh in terms of existing systems and where we are BitTorrent remains probably one of the largest decentralized systems in a sense um there are you know three million four million uh, active users out there on any given day um which which starts to reach like meaningful percentages of the global population that are actively using BitTorrent. Um, we can think about one other aspect of BitTorrent that's sort of interesting, which is um, you've got a lot of users, um, but then you've also got this this sort of metadata layer of finding new torrents, um, and that finding new torrents core that needs to exist to uh, allow you to discover the peers that you are in in your specific federated instance of, of BitTorrent um, comprises of something on the order of 400 open uh, torrent trackers that will maintain metadata, um, but also uh, the a Kademlia um, 
DHT, which is a, a distributed hash table um, that is made up by um, more normal peers that store metadata. Um, and, and there's roughly 4 million uh, torrents um, that, that are contained in that distributed hash table uh, of metadata about who is uh, participating in which torrent. Um, another federated system that, that's had a great year is Mastodon uh, as a uh, exemplar of uh, activity pub protocol and the Fediverse more generally um, has has on the order of three million users. Um, the, the the activity pub Fediverse uh, more generally is something like fifty different projects. Um, there are on the order of five thousand activity pub servers. Um, there this this. Fall, I guess there. There's been measurement from uh, the community data science collective uh, academic group looking at uh, activity on uh, Mastodon specifically. They find uh, something like seventy thousand tooting users who collectively toot roughly thirty thousand times per day. Um, and this um, sort of measured activity versus uh, total users is not an unexpected ratio um, on pretty much any social network. You would expect that. The majority of people there are consuming are not you know uh, posting public content. Um, more broadly, when we think about federated things, there's a lot of you know even foundational internet technology like email that that is federated still. Um, there there are on the order of six million email servers, uh, uh, so different IP addresses running the SMTP protocol. Um, there are. Um, you know, a, a bunch of uh, WordPress servers as well um, that you know uh, federate through um, comments and pingbacks and so forth. Um, Jitsi uh, reported this year that they have on the order of 20 million users of their uh, primary service uh, infrastructure. They didn't say how many uh, independent installations there are uh, because that's much harder to measure. Um, and Matrix had a great year and, and has grown to two and a half, three million users. Uh, and has at least uh, 11,000 uh, independent instances. Moving again on this, this graph towards external impact, uh, IPFS um, passed 2 million uh, users this year. Um, they have uh, a DHT uh, using the same Kademlia protocol as uh, BitTorrent, um, but uh, self-select a smaller core of uh, active nodes to participate in that DHT as a way to try and provide better uh, latency and availability guarantees in it. Um, and so their DHT is composed of somewhere in the five, 10,000 uh, DHT nodes. Um, of those uh, 2 million users, um, somewhere around 20% or 100,000 are, are running sort of a desktop uh, instance where they're staying on and are not being accessed through a web browser. Uh, and then participating in the DHT, one finds something on the order of 20 million different pieces of content that are being stored uh, in IPFS, uh, and, and in a given day, something like 8 million that are being retrieved through that DHT or being uh, finding metadata about who has them. Uh, Secure Scuttlebutt is a offline first decentralized uh, network. Um, it's got an order of 10,000 users, um, and it uses um, public servers uh, as as it's uh, as, as a mechanism for storing and forwarding uh, when users are offline. Um, yeah, and it has uh, on the order of a hundred of those. Um, the previously I mentioned Earthstar that that uses a sort of a similar partial replication uh, and and is sort of this this network is is really going. Um, further on the sort of decentralization um, and uh, meant for small independent collectives than many of the others. Um, and then finally, um, Bitcoin uh, has, you know, only about a million active uh, addresses or accounts uh, and uh, about 11,000 nodes that are running the full uh, Bitcoin protocol. And this is um, not a dissimilar ratio to what you'll find on all the other projects of this type. Um, and so again, you've got this uh, fairly large gap between uh, users and uh, servers or, or uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of the elevated nodes that are, that are doing uh, 
more of the work and coordination. Um, part of that we can see in the benchmark case is that um, in order to validate and run the full protocol, you need to have all the historic data, which is up to about 300 gigabytes in this case. Um, so the cost of, of running this full node is non-trivial. It's not something you can run on a phone or even really on a you know, local desktop necessarily. Um, yeah. So from these, we can we can then say what what are the commonalities that that a bunch of these systems share. And I want to start by by you know I, I included in that you you might notice like a lot of federated systems, and and we can think of federation as you know this partial decentralization perhaps, right? That that we've gone from you know a central Facebook or Google where there's one entity to these federated systems, um, matrix, Jitsi, et cetera, et cetera, where, you know, there's a lot of instances of a server, but the server is distinct from a client. And we can, um, then, you know, that there is this distinction to be drawn of, well, okay, there, there are things like BitTorrent perhaps, although BitTorrent has, again, a tracker that's sort of like the server that's separate from the, the clients. Uh, although the tracker is, is, you know, getting phased out to the DHT. And, and so the point is, and, and this is, you know, I think why I, I think of federation as a lot of the part is that what federation is doing in some sense is it's extra externalizing the heterogeneity of resources, which is you've got some nodes that are more powerful, that are going to be always on, that have bandwidth. And in a federated system, we, we sort of explicitly run a different piece of software on them uh, that indicates that, that is, this is the server software. And in systems that we think of more traditionally as, you know, true peer-to-peer, -peer, um, within the software, there end up being heuristics that try and do the same thing, um, that, that try and guess, should this node uh, take on more of the coordination work? Um, because one of the things that all of these networks want to do is make efficient use of resources. And those resources are not evenly distributed, right? Some, some nodes have more disk space, have more bandwidth, have better availability. And your system is going to perform better if you're able to take advantage of that. Um, and so we can, and, and I think, you know, it, I, I don't know if I, I think of this as cheating, but you can think of these as two different problems, which is there's one problem, which is how good of heuristics can I have to self-select nodes into being servers versus clients? Uh, and then how do I make decentralized protocols? Um, and those are, those are somewhat different. Um, and, and, and as a result, you can say, do I need to figure out how to have good heuristics? Uh, or do I just start with federation, which seems to be getting us a couple orders of magnitude more users and more success. Uh, and then I can make packaging and make auto selection of client and server um, and, and opting into those positions um, be a thing that happens um, independently of that uh, or, or happens later as, as a different problem to solve. The, the counter Right is is that you you think of message passing and 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 how your communication model will happen purely in terms of a, a single node uh, and this is this is you know the the natural thing that you end up with when you when you do that and you go on the full sort of I'm I'm a node and there are other nodes like me but let's let's take the view of a single user or a single node is you end up with something that looks like gossip um, this is what secure scuttlebutt. Um, uses in a sense, uh, or, or is based on initially. Um, and, and the basic concept here is I get a message and I want to then send it out to everyone else I'm connected to. So that messages sort of disseminate through, uh, the mesh through the decentralized mesh. Um, and we have a bunch of optimizations on that initial concept. So things like I will then send out, you know, an identifier of the message to see if the person I'm going to send it to has already gotten it. And then if they have, I'm not going to send it so that I don't waste the full bandwidth of sending that message over every edge. Um, but one of the things that's true when you, when you start there is there's no concept of the structure of the network itself. Right, um, because you're you're sort of uh, considering a node in isolation. What you what you don't have is any ability to then uh, pull back from there to look at the the full network and and start to say useful things about that. And so, 
Um, one of one of the things that is tough to say is like, will a message get to its recipient? How quickly will it get to its recipient? Because these are all questions that aren't about the single node, but are about the the structure and the connectivity of of the network more broadly. Um, and so it becomes hard to mesh this sort of communication with things like when should I form additional communications or, or additional connections? Uh, who should I remember? Um, and, and questions about how you maintain a strong network topology. And um, I think I think one of the things that we maybe uh, need to be thinking about is how do you combine uh, those two together so that you can start to have better guarantees and better understanding of the actual dynamic properties of uh, these decentralized networks. Um, because uh, we end up with very few properties uh, that we can say useful things about uh, in, in this sort of system of message passing uh, by itself in isolation. Um, to give a sense of a, a, a somewhat more concrete um, building block that, that ends up being the other one that we get use, um, that, that's distributed hash tables. Uh, and so a distributed hash table, uh, which, which many of you have probably uh, seen, at least in passing, um, is that we've got uh, a bunch of data and we've got a bunch of computers or participants in our network. And we're going to uh, come up with some identifier, maybe a hash, um, of both participants and uh, content, and we're going to put them in the same namespace. So it's the same hash, right? And then the the different nodes, the different computers, will store the content that is close to them. Um, so so you know I, I'm you know uh, you know person at position three. I'm going to store all of the content that hashes to four, five, six until there's some other node. So so I get some section um, of of the you know space of content based on where I hash to. Um, and then when I want to find content, I uh, find the node that I know about that is closest to that content, and I ask them. And if they know someone closer, they'll forward me on to that person. Uh, and so I end up finding the node that is responsible for that content. And uh, this as an, as an algorithm, there's a few different implementations, uh, and, and data sheets are in wide use. One of the nice things is that it's an abstraction that uh, you know, from outside, you can sort of think of it as a central database, a centralized database that that I can put stuff into it, and I can get stuff out of it, and I don't have to think about the dynamics within. Um, and it has this nice property that it sort of grows uh, as as you have more users, you can expect the users to each bring data, um, but but that uh, the the data per user isn't necessarily growing, and so it, it's you know efficiently keeping data across all the different users. Um, the other building block that we have here um, is uh, coming up with consensus. How do a set of decentralized nodes agree on something? Right. This is this is what we pioneer, or I don't know. This is this is what cryptocurrency really is relying on. Is is you have a bunch of nodes that want to all agree on something, um, but but that's you know a much more general problem. We've had this problem and have a set of systems for it uh, in centralized. Um, systems for a while, and it turns out that's more efficient. Uh, but when you think of what the problem for consensus is in those cases, they've actually been able to get away with a uh, weaker threat model. Uh, so Paxos, Raft, these are protocols for consensus um, that work within a threat model of fail stop. Uh, and, and what that means is nodes that are broken may not respond. They may delay, they may freeze, they may crash. Um, and despite some threshold of nodes, failing or crashing or not responding, uh, the system guarantees that the other nodes that are still working will agree on a, an outcome. Um, but in a decentralized world, uh, that, that ends up not being quite enough. Um, that, that what you want is a, a stronger uh, notion of what a bad node looks like. Uh, and so that's what gets called BFT, Byzantine Fault Tolerance. Uh, and, and that is tolerant of Byzantine nodes. Byzantine nodes being nodes that can act maliciously, uh, so they can do, uh, they can send arbitrary messages. Uh, so it's not that they just fail to send a message; it's that they send a message uh, indicating, you know, a different thing than they should have. Um, and so, uh, Bitcoin came along, did proof of work. Uh, in proof of work, you uh, are, are using sort of the scarce resource of computation. Uh, so how many times you can hash something. Um, as, as sort of a race that, that gets used to um, as long as the you know majority of the network uh, is all following this protocol. Uh, even if someone is uh, trying to do malicious things, uh, 
they uh, don't have enough power unless they are the majority um, to uh, mess that up. Um, and that's that's switched now, I think, because of you know environmental concerns and so forth, um, to proof of stake um, primarily. And proof of stake is uh, instead of using computation as that uh, scarce resource, it's using how much of the existing resource you have as that. Um, and one of the and, and so this is, you know, the, the there's there's a whole theory in here about things like uh, if you already have a bunch of it, you don't want to lose it, and so you're more likely to not uh, do something malicious. Um, but in both of these cases, uh, these are not um, systems that lead towards additional decentralization. Um, and and one of the things that that I think you know is at the heart here that of, of a lot of the problems for decentralized systems is this question of uh, symbols and identity, which is within the system itself, we don't really have uh, any firm notion of identity. So like, who is a user? What are, you know, is, is uh, some entity, you know, or some collection of users acting on behalf of one user or are they multiple users? Um, we, we, we can't meaningfully enforce that. When you think about how you enforce it, even for centralized systems, like the Facebooks or Google, they go to governments and they go to you know this like I'm going to identify you as a citizen or a person with some you know a driver's license, um, and if you don't have that external authority, that that stops making sense as a, a way to like appeal to authority. And so instead, uh, a lot of effort goes into trying to think about incentives and trying to make the system not uh, make it worthwhile to appear as multiple users when you are in in fact only one. Um, but, but the the flip side of that is that uh, the incentive actually incentivizes centralization um, because it, it it ends up meaning that it is better to be a single large entity than many small entities, and so that means that if it's better to be the the single large entity, that single large entity becomes more and more powerful over time. Um, okay, so that was. Uh, a set of, of building blocks. Let's let's go through limitations on these building blocks. Um, so DHTs are something that we have, um, and they they do grow uh, with with users. Uh, however, uh, so so as you get more users, you're going to have more content, and the the load and burden on each user in the DHT does not increase. However, there's a set of applications that uh, you just can't. Uh, really do with our current understanding of DHTs. So if I want to do web search and put identifiers for all of the web or for really any, you know, many millions of uh, identifiers, suddenly that's a lot of load that I would be needing out of each user on the DHT, right? So, you know, we can do something like a few million torrents total uh, based on that user base. Um, but are you going to be able to store hundreds of millions of, of items, uh, you know, all of the individual files and make those individually addressable, uh, that, that suddenly becomes really hard. And so this is a question of naming and thinking about, you know, what is an identifier that I want to be able to search for or look up? What are the things that I'm putting as the sort of entry points uh, for lookups? The other one is an interesting uh, or, or limit here in terms of scale, that these things don't, don't sort of fully scale, is that a lot of the applications that we want are uh, are, are interactive in nature. So, so we we want to be able to look up something and get a response in in an interactive way that is uh, you know compatible with web browsing or or some sort of you know I'm there as a user. Um, and DHTs take uh, something on you know asymptotically log in uh, lookups to find content. So I, fi I I find the node I'm connected to that's closest to it. They tell me someone who's even closer. As the DHT grows, that goes from two or three people that I need to talk to to three or four or five. And if each of those is taking, you know, 100 milliseconds, that starts growing quite a bit uh, to a point where even though it is log n, which is great, uh, it's it's more than constant and it stops being competitive with, with our centralized systems. The second uh, limit uh, is gossip as a gossip network grows larger, we start to uh, really find ourselves in a situation where we don't expect messages to necessarily end up going all the way across it. And so we stop being able to um, say things about like, you know, I'm in a local neighborhood, but I can't necessarily find a friend through the network. 
uh, because it becomes way too expensive for all messages to go to the whole message, the whole network. Um, and so there, there is something about network structure and about how you think about things beyond gossip that we need uh, in order to scale those networks. And the final one is, is an infrastructural one, um, which is that there continue to not be real world incentives that are pushing the infrastructure that we have uh, to support decentralized technologies. So it's still true, as it has been for decades, that a normal user's upload bandwidth is about half of their download bandwidth. Uh, this, this is true. This is a, the, a broadband fixed line one, but it's also true for, uh, for mobile. Um, but, but likewise, uh, when you think about like latency um, for, between end users, uh, when I think about a centralized system, uh, the latency for me to get there uh, keeps going down because they keep building edges closer to more of their users. Uh, and so on average, they actually end up getting closer to their users and, and lower latency. Uh, but when you look at, uh, and this is a, a ripe Atlas uh, probe, um, you know, 2015 or 2010 till now, the, the latency doesn't actually go down much. Like it, it goes down and this is, this is uh, a bunch of nodes trying to get into Europe and the latency from, from Russia goes down a little bit, but India is staying about the same. And we don't have money that's getting invested into the, the links that are uh, getting transited for traffic between two different end users, because that's not something that there, there's money that is incentivizing. Um, and so until we figure out a way to solve that, we're going to end up with a very sort of static um, latency and uh, bandwidth uh, profile. Uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I think running into question time, but I will finish with um, sort of the, the more meta properties uh, rather than, than the scaling limits that we need to think about. The first is um, coming up with a, a much stronger model of metadata exposure and privacy. We have end-to-end -end encryption. Um, we're able to protect the contents, um, but we don't typically protect either the size or communication patterns of who's talking to whom. And without servers and intermediaries, uh, I think basically all of these decentralized systems, um, less so federated, um, but even there, um, end user IP addresses uh, and, and the, you know, identity of, of where they are and what they're connecting as uh, ends up being something that is used for uh, the disintermediation. Uh, and, and as such, there's no real guarantee about how private you are or who could learn that you're participating or who you're talking with. Um, and so coming up with models where we get some limits on the retention, uh, so being able to say things like, you know, at some point after you uh, have stopped talking, uh, the system will not continue to hold on to your IP address or uh, who you've talked to. Your communication patterns is important and is not part of any of these models. Um, and so I'll end with uh, two things that, that I uh, go back to uh, when thinking about this. Uh, the first is a paper on the impossibility of full decentralization in permissionless, and this is on blockchains, but, but permissionless consensus, which basically um, it, it is the impossibility result that I brought up earlier when, when talking about how uh, in order to disincentivize civils, we move towards um, uh, we move towards in, encouraging centralization. Um, and I think this is a framing question, which is the the incentive to decentralize is actually a uh, a an incentive that happens in a larger picture. It's not the system itself. But it's the entities around your system that that are the incentive to not have centralization, right? It's the governments, it's the regulations, and and it's it's the other dynamics that that are why you would want to not be centralized. And we don't have that in our model. Uh, and likewise, um, the tech policy perspective um, is a um, is is saying essentially there are these very powerful uh, existing. Uh, entities that will attempt to uh, identify the points of power and regulate them. And that ends up being why we need this decentralization in some sense, is to prevent uh, being co-opted by existing systems of power. Uh, that, that that's, that's where we find the motivation for our decentralization. So I will end there. Uh, I guess we have maybe a couple minutes for questions. You're muted for me. Yes, thank you. We have a few questions from the audience. The first is, what do you think is the future for decentralized social media? 
Will there have to be a major event for decentralized social media to gain more traction? It's a good question, right? So, so social media, I mean, is uh, an interesting and problematic beast in its own way, right? Which is this is this is something that we haven't really uh, traditionally had in the same way, um, and and so one of the questions maybe to step back is is what what do you actually want um having the, the 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 part of social media that is you and your communities and your friends i think we already can do and we'll continue to see more sort of localized things um, because they they give us the same experience um figuring out how you broadcast a celebrity or these these sort of more uh large-scale zeitgeist ideas um is is where we um are much less developed. And so part of that less developed also means that there's more potential for uh, further technological development to make that more possible. So I'm optimistic that we get there, but I think that's further off. Okay, and another question related to that, but probably more into direction of user experience. Can we abstract the decentraliz decentralization to ease the use for the average user? Yeah, I mean, and, and there's a couple of things there, right, which is we are starting to have libraries and patterns that other developers can build better user experiences on. Um, I think we're seeing also that there are easier to use uh, sort of end user compatible systems that, that are views into decentralized networks. So be that the things like uh, Manyverse or Planetary, which are mobile apps that came out this year for Secure Scuttlebutt, uh, or Radical and these just sort of desktop uh, apps that provide uh, Git or other uh, types of decentralized um, network views that, that don't require setup or, or work. Um, we're, we're getting better at user interfaces um, and, and we're having building blocks that, that are not themselves particularly visible or require configuration. And a more technical question that just came in. What do you think of the trade-offs made by single hop DHTs and their huge local routing tables? Right. So this is this is an interesting question, and it's it's where a bunch of uh, thought is being put right now. Um, and so 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 one of the things you could say, right, is in the same way that uh, a federated system is externalizing. Um, this this disjoint resource uh, or resource heterogeneity between uh, sort of highly available nodes that might make up your DHT uh, and and the sort of end user more transient nodes that that are querying it. You could have a DHT that tries to self organize in a uh, to 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 take uh, advantage of even more heterogeneity. So you find nodes that are you know more powerful and you have you know uh, multiple layers uh, or, or a hierarchical DHT where some DHT nodes forward queries into a smaller center uh, that's that's more powerful. Um, and you end up with something where you probably can uh, get rid of some of these like um, uh, log n style latency things to, to make them be able to scale more at the expense of um, something that starts to look like more centralization, that there end up being a smaller number of nodes in the center that if they do go down or if they decide to censor things, they actually can have really, they, they end up with a lot of power in the system, which is starting to be scary. Um, so, so there's a trade off there. And um... <laughs> Next question, given the popularity of Cademlia, have probabil probabilistic models won the decentralized architecture or are they better suited to decentralization? It's a good question. Um, I think Cademlia, I don't know if it won just because it's probabilistic. I think it, it has something to do with, uh, it, it, it's fairly simple to conceive of, right? Like we often uh, say, these, you know, these distributed systems are really hard to reason about. Um, and in some sense, that's like this, uh, you know, I've done one thing and it was, uh, and, and, and I'm out of ideas. Um, that they're, they're, you know, one thing that I took away at least from that set of building blocks that I presented was there were only three or four things that are underlying all of these things. We really have not looked through a lot of this design space. Uh, and so I am not at all uh, unconvinced that trying something radically different we can find other models of decentralization that are more performant and that have different properties, and we just haven't explored enough. So I think that's a no. 
Okay, in the last question until now, do you think decentralized writable storage like IPFS is threatened by toxic data sets like Libgen? No, oh, okay. So, so there's an assumption that Libgen is a toxic data set, uh, but uh, beyond that, um, I, I mean, I think there, there's a there's a very reasonable story for any of these systems for how you uh, sanitize them or make them compatible with external power structures. Um, and so, in an IPFS-like thing, um, users are opting into pinning or storing uh, data. Uh, as notes, uh, so so it's only either uh, you've, um, you've you've decided to pin uh, data in order to make it reavailable to others, and so um, there are uh, you know as, as a node, if you get a DMCA complaint or you get a complaint that something is is illegal, you can blacklist it. You can say I'm not going to pin or reserve that data, uh, and so there's a way for each individual user in the system uh, as they get complaints to um, not make that data reavailable. Um, and, and limit their liability. So, so you'll get, you know, as as there's different uh, regulatory environments, people will be able to comply with their own regulatory environments, um, and and so I, I I think that you know is probably enough. You know, um, the 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 bigger question is like, okay, does that cause the software to be seen in the same light as BitTorrent? Uh, and that's that's a I think a a, a more philosophical question. Um, and and is as much a, a like a, a perception and finding good uses that you can counter things with uh, as anything else. Okay, thank you. That were the questions. Thank you for the interesting talk and for being here answering the audience questions. Thank you. This is great.